Excellent. We're live, I think. Um, hi, everyone. This is Thomas Newman of Viva Financial Tuition, and I am gate crashing uh, Ben Wilson's party tonight. Uh, ben is going to be talking you through the, the, the MCS, okay, the first half of the MCS. So this is a free session, and it is the first uh, of a number of sessions that we'll be running for the MCS for November 2021. Um, welcome to everyone. I think we've got a good attendance tonight. So I see we've got 78. 79, 81. Okay, so the number is, is going up, 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 up. Excellent. And uh, we've got people joining from all over the world. You're very, very welcome. And um, that's great to see. So Ben is going to, he's going to give a little introduction in a while, and he's going to leave time for questions and answers at the end of today's session. It's going to last for about two hours total. There'll be a break in the middle, um, at about the one hour mark. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share some details of Viva's full course. So as I said, this is just the first session of an, one of a, a many that we will be running. So tonight's session is free. Uh, the remaining sessions are not. So if you are thinking about sitting the uh, November 2021 exam and you're looking for a course, Viva has a couple of options and I'm going to talk you through them now. So what I need to do is share my screen. Yes. So Can you see that, Ben? Yep, great. Excellent. Okay, so some of you may know um, about Viva, some of you may not. Um, this is just to say that you're in safe hands, basically, with Viva. So we've analyzed a lot of cases over the years since our inception in 2017. We've analyzed about 50 cases, top to bottom, across the different levels. And in that time, We've served about 7,000 students. We've had students from all over the world. We've had students um, with all sorts of circumstances. So we've had world prize winners. We've had students who are struggling. We have students who are um, you know, facing uh, very challenging local, local circumstances, et cetera. So we've seen it all really and helped many different types of students. Um, our students are very, very happy, I think, with uh, the courses that we've been running for the, the case study in particular. It's our specialty. They've ranked our uh, rated our, our most recent uh, courses 4.7 out of 5. So it's uh, not perfect, but uh, we're getting there and uh, we intend to um, to beat that if we can this year. Um, we're SEMA specialists. So from day one, we've been offering SEMA courses. We're still focused on SEMA. And while I suppose a lot of tuition providers have been moving online uh, in these times, we were born online. Uh, and uh, we've kept it that way and don't intend to be anything but an online tuition provider that allows us to save on costs and pass savings on to, to students in the form of a much lower price. Very happy to say that at the end of 2020, our efforts were recognized with the SEMA's Global Pass Rate Excellence Award. And what this means is that the courses that we ran um, led to our students exceeding the average pass rates for SEMA. And there were only six tuition providers that received this award worldwide, uh, Viva, Kaplan, BPP, HTFT, First Intuition and Wisdom. Uh, we were very, very proud of that. Uh, you know, we aim to offer courses of at least equivalent quality to the uh, most expensive providers in the, the market. And uh, to join this list was certainly, I think, uh, a big, big achievement for, for Viva. Okay, so there are two very good options to unlock the MCS course that we are offering, as I said, tonight's session is free, the remaining sessions are not. So there's all access and there's the MCS elite course. So with all access, you unlock access, not just to the MCS course, but you unlock access to all of the SEMA courses at vivatuition.com for 365 days. So it's about, it's about a thousand hours of study content in total when you uh, add up the, the video um, lectures, uh, the questions, the mock exams, the notes, the texts from BPP that we bundle in. And with that, uh, you unlock obviously access to this current MCS course as well. So you get seven live webinar sessions. And tonight is the first of the seven live webinar sessions. They're all recorded and will be put up at vivatuition.com. You also get five mock exams based on this case. And you get model solutions with those, but it's important to mention that with all access, you do not get marking included, okay? So that's all access. With the MCS Elite course, it's a little bit different. So 
you do unlock access to everything at vivatuition.com, all of the courses. So it's very useful to go back and review something from E2 or F2 or P2, uh, but you only unlock it for 90 days, okay? Uh, you get access to the seven live webinar sessions, and I'll talk about what is involved with the, each of the live webinar sessions soon. And um, you also get five mock exams based on this MCS pre-scene. The difference is you get marking included. You also get the model solutions, but you get all of those five mocks marked by a tutor. So uh, very, very useful indeed. Also, you get access to six live workshops. They're two hours each, and we'll be Ben doing those workshops. Very, very exam-focused sessions. I'll talk about what's involved in those workshops in a minute. You get weekly office hour calls with Ben, and you get a pass guarantee. So um, you basically get access to the February 2022 um, MCS Elite course if you fail. We don't think you will if you take the course seriously. Uh, if you fail in November, you get free access to the, the February uh, course, okay? So let's dive a little bit more into the details of uh, what's included in both of these options. So the live webinars, there are seven of these. The first one is tonight. It's the first half of the pre-scene, and that's a free session, okay? All of these are recorded, by the way, and will be made available to uh, Viva students. So whether you're all access or whether you're elite course, you get access to all of these seven webinar sessions. First half of the pre-scene tonight. Tomorrow is the industry overview. Uh, on Wednesday, we have the second half of the pre-scene analysis. Then we've got a little bit of a break. And then we've got three sessions revolving around the theories from E2, F2, and P2, and applying those to the, the, uh, the, the pre-scene. And then we've got the key issues where we take the 10 most important topics for this case and uh, talk about very likely exam issues. So they're really, really useful, all of these webinar sessions. As I said, the first one tonight, free, and we will send out the recording tomorrow to everyone who's attended. Um, the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh sessions are not free, okay? So you do need to be either an All Access member or you need to uh, have purchased the MCS Elite course. So there are the seven live webinars. Then, as I said, you get access to everything at vivatution.com with both All Access and with the Elite course. The difference is with All Access, you get 365 days of access. With the Elite course, you get access for the duration of this particular exam window. So you get basically 90 days access. And uh, you can unlock peer reviews of E2, F2, and P2. Uh, you unlock a series of videos on preparing for the MCS. You unlock a series of videos on the exam day strategy. So what you do on the day of the exam, what the examiner is looking for, how do you manage your time well, et cetera. You get those five mock exams based on this MCS and model solutions are included there. And you get access to our full E2, F2 and P2 courses so that you can dive back into any theoretical point that you need to review. Very, very useful indeed. Okay, so the next steps, if you want to opt for the all access option and you're not already an all-access uh, student, register for this webinar. Well done. That's done. And we're going to run a discounted all-access membership for the next 48 hours. Okay, so usually it's £299 for 365 days of access to everything at vivatuition.com. Uh, that we think is exceptionally good value. We're going to drop that further and run it at £229 for the next 48 hours. Okay, and I'll include a link in the chat box after I'm finished, okay? And uh, once you do that, you will be emailed the links to register for the remaining webinar sessions, the remaining six webinar sessions, okay? And remember the next one is tomorrow. Um, so that's if the all access option uh, is of interest to you. And I suppose the, the, the very useful thing with all access is that it allows for very fast progression through the SEMA qualification. Um, you know you've got access for 365 days. So once you're finished with this exam, it's right on to the, the, the uh, strategic level, E3, F3, P3, if you need to take those, uh, and then into the SCS, which you will have access to for the next number of windows. You'll have access to the SCS for the next year. And um, uh, that's obviously very, very beneficial. So if you have any doubts about that, please email us at info at vivatuition.com info at vivatuition.com, okay? So the remainder uh, of this uh, PowerPoint shows you what you unlock with the 
elite course. Okay, and the, the elite course is really, really useful, I think, for students who have maybe struggled with this exam before, maybe you failed once or even more, uh, and you're not quite sure where you're going wrong, or for students who are, um, you know, very, very ambitious about doing well on this exam. We've seen, you know, quite remarkable improvements for people who come on the elite course uh, and take it seriously and do the work, and there is quite a bit of work involved, but it is a, a very, very complete MCS course. We benchmarked it very carefully against other tuition providers. We think it is uh, as good an MCS course as there is in the tuition space. So you get access to these two-hour live workshops with Ben. Uh, they're two hours each. There are six of them, very exam-focused. Um, you know, you look at the exam and marking process, what the examiner is actually looking for. You look at uh, how to generate ideas for answers, how to actually apply theory effectively, how to manage your time, what a good answer look like, looks like, what a bad answer looks like, etc. Very, very practical sessions indeed. You also get access to Ben um, in these weekly office hour sessions. So you can pop in um, and chat to him about any concerns you have about the, the case, the exam, etc. Uh, and that's very, very useful. It's a, a more informal way, I suppose, of uh, accessing your tutor and um, talking to him about your, your strengths, your weaknesses, and concerns you have about the exam. There are six of those. And you get access to, with the Elite course, uh, a private Slack group. So you join your fellow students and Ben. Um, you know, ben will be on there most days um, posting interesting articles, posting um, additional uh, comments, etc. And you can interact with your fellow students. Again, it's a more informal way to um, you know, to, to learn. Uh, so we have all of these formal webinars and workshops, etc. There are about 22 hours of class classes included in this uh, elite course. Um, but what we find is that uh, students can really come up with very interesting insights themselves in the in the Slack group. And, uh, you know, they can uh, come up with scenarios, etc. that help their fellow students. And certainly they help us think of the case uh, or come at the case from a different uh, perspective. So a really good way to learn too. So, you know, we think that this is a very, very strong option if you're looking to do well in this exam. Uh, so you've got, you know, the, the coaching element and Ben will act as a coach throughout this course between the tutor calls, the Slack group, et cetera. You've got a lot of live webinars and workshops, 22 hours of class time total. They're all live uh, and they're all recorded for you to look back at later. Uh, you get access to everything at vivitution.com. And you get mock exams, very, very good mock exams. My team has been working very, very hard on those. Uh, we're very, very pleased with them. And uh, they come with marking, which is crucial. And of course, you get access to that private Slack group too. So next steps, if you want to register for the Elite course, you can book your place by paying a £99 deposit. Okay. I should mention the price. So the price for the Elite course is £699. That's the standard price. For the next 48 hours, we will run this uh, at a discounted price of £599, okay? There are only 20 places on this course, the elite course, okay? We intentionally keep the group size small because it allows us to give a lot of attention to each individual who comes in the course. And what I should also, also mention is that 14 of these places are already taken. Uh, so there are only six places left. I know that sounds like... Um, um, you know, marketing spiel, you know, act fast, you know, book your place now. Uh, but it, it, it happens to be true. Okay, there are only six places left. So uh, I would act fast if this is of interest to you. Uh, I'll include a link um, to a fuller description of this course, and also the link to pay the £99 deposit if you're interested in that. So what would happen is you pay the £99 deposit that guarantees your spot on the course. And then the remaining 500 pounds, remember we're dropping the price from 699 total to 599 total uh, for the next 48 hours. And the remainder, so the 500 pounds remaining on the, the balance, um, you can choose to pay that over up to six months. So you would pay the first installment at the start of next month, the second installment at the, the, the start of the following month, et cetera, et cetera, until you paid off uh, the remainder of the balance. Also important to mention that if you're actually already an all access member, you get this for a lower price. You get it for 499, okay? So if you're an all access member already and you're looking to kind of supercharge your MCS preparation, the elite course is a really good option too. And you can get it for 499. So you pay the 99 pound deposit 
and you'd have 400 pounds left to pay. And you can choose to pay that, pay that over one month, three months, four months, five months, up to six months. Okay, so that's useful. You can spread out the, the cost. Um, so we recognize that it's it's you know, a significant amount of money for a student to pay, but it is a very, very complete course. And there's a lot of attention paid to the students that come on this course. That is not to say that you know, we don't pay attention to students who take the, the standard course option with something like all access, because they also get access to some great webinar content and they get access to the mock exams, et cetera, on the site and a lot of content at vivatution.com. It's just, as I said, if you're struggling with the MCS or you want to do really, really well on the exam, then the elite course is a, is a great option. Um, we've benchmarked this, as I said, against other tuition providers. And what we find is that um, typically courses like this, involving this amount of, um, I suppose, personalized attention to students, um, they typically run for well in excess of £1,000. Okay. Um, so while we recognize you know, it's a significant amount of money to, have, to pay for a course, it is a very, very good investment, especially compared to um, other. Um, options that exist. So uh, once you book your place in the course, you will get all access membership to everything at vivatution.com for 90 days. And Viva will email you the links to the six webinar, uh, sorry, workshop events, the links to the remaining live webinars, uh, the link to the private Slack group and a terms and conditions sheet for signature. Okay. If you have any doubts, please email us at info at I'm going to pop these links into the, the chat box now. Um, and I'm also going to send an email out to those of you who registered after this session so that you have these links, etc. cetera. Um, so that's it for me. I'm going to hand over to Ben now and um, enjoy the session. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Ben, I need to make you the host now. Thank you. Let's see. Um, Thomas, there's a couple of sort of questions. I've answered most of the questions in the chat panel Q&A as they've come in, but there's a couple that uh, I don't know the answer to. So if you're able to um, do I'll, questions before. I will indeed. I'll take a look. Ben, um, maybe you are the, uh, the host already. I think you are actually, Ben. Well, I've been promoted. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to stop. I'm going to shut up, basically. I'm going to stop my video. I'm going to mute myself, and I'll be in the chat box. Uh, best of luck, Ben, and see you, everyone. Take care. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. So your screen is going to change slightly now. Um, so welcome to this session. My name's Ben Wilson. I'm going to be taking you through uh, the, the rest of this evening session. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if you've got any questions as we're going through the content this evening, if you could post those questions in the Q&A panel or hold on to those questions, and we'll have a 15 minute session at the end where we'll deal with as many of those questions as possible. Um, so the aims tonight, three aims. Firstly, we're going to be going through the pre-scene in detail to make sure you've got a thorough understanding of the document. And tonight's gonna to be the first half of the document. And as we're going through it, we're going to be building linkages between the information we're given there and the technical content that underlies management case study. So things that are to do with business strategy, E2, things to do with management accounting, P2, and things to do with financial reporting, F2. And we're going to be building those linkages, really important because it's going to highlight where you're going to need to go back into those technical papers um, and make sure your knowledge is really up to scratch. And actually, a lot of those on-demand resources that you get with Viva Tuition, access to all of the on-demand content for those technical papers, is going to be really helpful for you in making sure you've got your technical knowledge as sharp as possible. Uh, and then the third aim is to highlight where we might want to go off and do any additional study as well. So our content tonight, uh, we're going to be covering the first half of the pre-scene document. Um, so if you've looked at it already, then that's going to take us roughly up to where the, the financials start, uh, probably about the first 11 pages or so. Uh, and we'll be leaving about 15 minutes at the end uh, for question and answer. So before we go into the content, just a bit of background about me um, and uh, why I'm, Viva Tuition are working with, with me uh, on management case study. Um, so I started my career at KPMG. I worked as an auditor, um, looking at lots of different businesses. I used to, uh, my, my main audit clients were the BBC um, and TUI Travel. 
I worked there for about five years. And in my last couple of years, um, I worked in KPMG's more sort of advisory consulting side. Um, and so a lot of the stuff I used to do in practice actually is advising businesses on the types of issues you see coming up in management case study. So I've got practical real world experience of this stuff. Um, after I left KPMG, um, I joined Kaplan as a lecturer um, and I worked at Kaplan for 12 years or so. Um, I had various different management roles while I was there, but I, I was head of SEMA at Kaplan uh, for three or four years. When they first brought in this new structure to SEMA uh, with, the, uh, with the technical papers um, and then the case studies, uh, I was head of Kaplan at that point for SEMA, so I was involved a lot in their course design. Um, and so I know this, this structure and this qualification inside out. Um, I, since leaving um, Kaplan, um, I, I started working as an examiner. So writing exam papers and grading exam papers. Um, and I work as an examiner with the ICAW. Um, I also have an examining uh, role at ACCA as well, uh, not at SEMA, which is why I'm allowed to deliver this course. Um, and I also work with the London School of Economics. I'm their head tutor for executive education programs, um, which again involves actually a lot of the same sort of content um, as the, the case study course here, where we're advised, we're looking at advising businesses on practical decisions that they're having to make. Uh, so I've got a lot of experience of both lecturing particularly management case study, and I've got lots of real world experience as well uh, that helps to support um, the, the, this type of content for case study, which is really applied. Okay, that's me. And we're now gonna spend the rest of the session going through the precinct document. So hopefully you've uh, you've had a chance to look at this document already. Um, if you haven't done so, you can download a copy of it uh, from SEMA's website. Um, and what we're gonna be doing is going through it I've got some annotations that I've already made on it, and we're going to be discussing those. And I'm also going to be adding a few extra notes as well. Uh, so if you've got a, like me, if you're old fashioned um, and you like printed copies of things, if you have got a printed copy of it, it'd be really good if you're making annotations and notes as we're going through the session. Uh, if you don't have a printed out copy and you've got it on your screen because you're a millennial and printed is just destroying the environment, then I would advise you to have your copy alongside this session so you can be typing notes uh, as we're going through. So I'll just give you a chance to do that. Excellent. So hopefully you, you, you've got a chance to organise your screen and get your bits and pieces in front of you. Um, and we're now going to go through the pre-scene document. Now, this pre-scene is standard. It's normal, it is totally typical for what we get for management case study. A load of background about the industry so that anyone who doesn't understand smart speakers and doesn't, hasn't seen anything around heating controls, if you've never heard of these things, well, there's enough information in here for you to be able to understand what the market is. Um, so it's a kind of level playing field. And then we get lots of information about the company, including its financials, so that we can pre-prepare so that we're ready for whatever they throw at us in the exam. And I like to think of this document as this is my pre-preparation for going out for a meeting with the client. I'm a consultant and I know I'm going for a meeting with the client. So before I go for that meeting, I do some research. I make sure I know my background about the client and I make sure I know their current financial position so that when I go for the meeting with the client and they ask me questions, I'm ready for those questions. The meeting with the client, by the way, is the exam. And the questions that they throw at you are the things that the client is asking you there and then. The more preparation that you've done beforehand, the better you understand the company and the industry, the better able you are to deal with the questions that the client throws at you. So first bit we're given is a little bit of introduction about the company. Um, and it tells us the first lovely bit of information is that they are quoted, they're listed. Now that means linking that back to the underlying pay technical papers, F2 financial reporting, an element of that is sources of finance. And so as a listed company, this means they've got access to equity finance so they can tap up their existing shareholders, perhaps with a rights issue, 
or they could issue new shares relatively easily because their shares are tradable on an exchange. And they also have access to debt finance. So if they want to raise tradable loans, debentures, then they're able to do so. Now that's useful information for us in the exam because if one of the things that the client wants to do is to pursue a new project for which they require cash, well, these guys have access to finance to be able to do it. It also tells us that they're a manufacturer and that they do that manufacturing in their home country, Westland, which has a strong local economy. Now, that's useful information for us because given it's a strong developed country, we can assume things like, well, the, um, our, our clients are going to be able to afford a premium product. That's useful for Frinta because we sell our premium product at a premium price, particularly with the smart controls. Um, and it also means that because it's a developed country, we can assume that most homes are going to have a decent internet connection. So I'm just going to type it as we're going through. I'll do a little bit of typing just so there's stuff happening on screen as well. Um, so internet at home is going to be relatively strong um, in, in this country, which means uh, that our smart speakers are going to work um, and our smart controls are going to be functional. Um, if we were in a developing country, uh, then it might mean that some of this high tech gadgetry that we use might not be particularly functional. Um, so that might limit our exports. So it limits our export potential. Um, we can only really export to countries that have um, a, a kind of well-developed internet, I don't know, um, technology and, and infrastructure so that uh, clients are able to, um, to, to use our products. Um, this is standard down here that we are a financial manager um, because at management case study, the idea is the level we're at is kind of mid level in a finance department. But operational case study, you were a lower level financial um, employee who would be involved in processing type tasks. As a mid level finance employee, a finance manager, we're getting involved in bigger picture decisions. Um, and there's some really good examples here uh, with this financial manager role section. Um, as you move through to strategic case study, then you're going to be leading the finance department and get involved in even bigger decisions. OK, so that's typical, normal, all of this stuff uh, that, that we're told so far. Uh, going down into Frinter's history and products, um, some of this is ancient history. You know, what we did in the 1970s, you know, how relevant is it to today? It's just setting the scene. Um, but something I think that's really useful in this paragraph here um, is this bit here where it talks about a lot of our products being installed in new homes. Now, that has lots of implications for us. Um, it's going to limit our ability to make repeat sales because these thermostats get installed in a new home and frankly, they stay there. So once we've sold to an end customer once, we're not going to sell to them again. Um, another thing that's really interesting out of the fact that our product is so dependent on new homes is that it is a really cyclical industry. And what I mean by that is that when an economy is booming, you tend to see home building really ticking up. Um, However, when the economy is contracting, you will see house building is one of the first industries to stop and to slow down. So during the good times, we're going to really sell a lot of our product because more homes are being built. And when the economy is contracting, you would expect to see our sales will really fall. Um, and so that means if you think back to your F2 studies, um, and uh, weighted average cost of capital, this means we're going to have a high beta factor um, because our, um, our sales are gonna be brilliant when, um, when the economy is booming and really contract when the economy is falling. 
means we're higher risk. Um, and that means, that means we're gonna have a higher cost of capital than perhaps a company um, that makes sales um, it, 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 that, that are more kind of resilient and not so dependent on the, the state of the economy. Okay, so lots of good analysis that can come out of, of, of that, um, out of that, out of that section there. Um, going down into this, um, this bit about heating controls, this is real background information. We're not going to spend too long here. Um, although, if you look at that heating control there, I grew up in a house that had that heating control. Um, that's what was in every house in the UK 25, 30 years ago. Um, and actually, I moved house in January of this year. We bought quite an old property. And when we moved in, that type of heating control was what was in place here. Um, and we've upgraded it. We now have a proper kind of smart, uh, smart meter, uh, the kind of thing that Frinter sells. So there are opportunities, I guess what we can take out of that, there are opportunities um, to sell to people who are kind of retrofitting an existing house. But I think the majority of our sales, and that's certainly the theme of this advanced information, the majority of our sales are to people who are building new homes. Um, this bit down here, again, real background information about how radiators work. Nothing particularly exciting in here. Um, a little bit about kind of green credentials um, that um, by upgrading to um, a smart thermometer system, and then you're going to save on your energy bills and maybe linking it into kind of COP26, which is just around the corner. This is more of an emphasis for both government and lots of consumers um, that, um, that, that it's, it, it's on the agenda. And so perhaps that could help to drive sales. Um, COP26 is the, is the meeting of, um, of, of, of leading nations around agreeing climate change targets for the next five years that could drive sales for us. Um, and that's happening just as your exam is going to be going on. Um, so a nice thing for you to do, showing a little bit of wider research, is to drop in a sentence somewhere about what's happening with COP26. That shouldn't be the whole aim of your answer, but it is useful to show that you are reading around what's happening around the subject matter um, and they will give you credit for dropping in the odd little thing like that. Okay, uh, on to the next page. Um, we're looking at something that is we are told repeatedly in this advanced information um, is that we have um, beautiful products. They are aesthetic. The, the design, the look and the feel of our products is the thing that really makes us stand out. So I kind of read that and think, well, who are Frinter in the marketplace? You know, all these companies are made up, but they're all based on real companies. We're Apple, I think. That's who we're, we're positioned at. Um, and it talks later about there being a, an established market leader. I can't pronounce their name. It's something unpronounceable that starts with a Y. Um, they're the, they were the first movers into the smart speaker market. Um, I think they, they are Amazon with the Alexa. We're Apple coming in second with a beautiful product. Um, also tells us in this paragraph that we are dominant in domestic heating. Great fact lock it away and drop it into your answer somewhere, wherever it's relevant. You want to show in your answer that you have memorized a few key facts from here. And one of them is that we are the key player in that marketplace. And um, it also, I think that's quite useful for a bit of further analysis as well, um, because we're going to have some brand recognition. Um, even if uh, it's a slightly funny market, this, a lot of the people who are using our heating controls didn't decide to put them in because they bought the house a new house that already had this smart control within it so they didn't decide to buy the frinter product but they look at it almost every day they see that product displayed prominently in their house and so they're used to the frinter brand name they know us they associate us with the quality of our of our heating control 
And so that's kind of set the scene for us to be able to launch our smart speaker quite effectively uh, because people already knew our brand. OK, into the next paragraph, um, it tells us, look, just like Apple, we invest heavily in product design. Another hint that that's who we are. Um, and having invested in product design, um, we've got, and we're going to discuss this a little bit further on as well, um, we've got um, R&D expenditure. Um, and we're going to be thinking about, we'll discuss this later, thinking about how we decide whether to capitalize our expenditure um, or whether we have to expense it in our statement of profit and loss. And we will return to that as we, as we go through. Okay, um, down here, more expansion on the fact that we're quoted um, and thinking about the effect that decisions have on our weighted average cost of capital. And we'll just explore that in a little bit of detail here. I'm just going to give a couple of extra notes on that as well. Um, so our weighted average cost of capital is linking our risk to return. Um, an investor in our business, someone who buys shares or debt, will be looking at the risk profile of the company and using that to determine their required return. And if we take on a project that is higher risk, so if we have higher risk, they're going to require more return. Which is something we want to consider when the business is wanting us to our advice on should we invest in this new product, should we enter this new market? Um, well, if it's higher risk, an investor is going to need a higher return. And that is going to increase our cost of capital. Um, and that increased cost of capital percentage, and you remember this back from when you studied F2, the higher your cost of capital is, the higher your discount rate is in your MPV calculations. And what that does, so we're going to have a higher discount rate. And that higher discount rate in our MPV calculations is going to lower the MPV of projects. In effect, that higher cost of capital will feed through to meaning that the business, for it to say yes to a project, for it to have a positive MPV, that, that project is going to have to be a better project because of our higher risk and therefore higher funding cost and greater return required by investors. Now, that was quite technical. If you listen to that and thought, oh my God, I've got no idea what he's talking about. Cost of capital, discount fat. I can't even spell MPV, let alone remember what it is. Well, the joy of the resources you're provided with Viva Tuition is that you can go back into the detailed recordings around cost of capital um, and recap that subject area with the recordings that you're given. OK, now um, we're told in the next paragraph um, about our expansion um, of incorporating new technologies in our design. This is showing you the kind of ethos of the company. Um, our ethos and our culture is that we continuously improve. We're always looking at trying to improve our products, particularly around their aesthetic design, but also around that functionality. And that kind of that, that mindset and that ethos and that culture is something that we want to be using and quoting when we're assessing any future strategies that the business is doing. If they want to take the, uh, their business down market or they're, they're going to, I don't know, not do so much in the way of product development, you know, that goes against what we're known for as a brand and could, could damage our brand. Okay. Um, into our, and, and, and actually, um, I mentioned this earlier, talking about research and development expenditure. The more that we are introducing new technologies into our design, the more that we're going to have this balance between research and development expenditure. And the rules on this are quite complicated. Um, but I kind of, for me, there's kind of two or three principles that are very important. 
Um, you know, in the early stages, um, when we're first researching something, then that expenditure should be expensed in the statement of profit and loss. And at the later stages, when this product is a winner, we know it's going ahead, then it is development cost and we capitalize it on our statement of financial position um, and eventually we'll end up amortizing it to spread the cost of um, this, this expenditure over the useful life of the product that we're developing. Now, the rules are complicated about where the cutoff point is. The start and the end are quite clear, but you know, where do we decide that it goes from being speculative research into it's definitely going to be a winner and it's now development? And there are two things that are really important. The first one is technical feasibility. Have we proved that this product works? If we have proved that with our testing, then it's falling into being development. Um, the second one is that we have a proper plan and funding in place to be able to complete this de development of the product. If those things are in place, it's development expenditure and therefore we capitalise it. But once we are into capitalising it, another area around this is, well, what period should we amortise it over? What's the useful life of the technology that's going into a smart speaker? How long will we be able to sell it for? And that is a real judgment call. This is a new market. We don't really know how long people are going to want their smart speakers for. When's the next thing coming in? And so there's a real judgment call for management around how long the useful life is. So lots of stuff in this case study around R&D expenditure, an area for you to go back and look at, particularly around the criteria and around the amortization. OK, uh, next paragraph is about these, this disruptive technology of smart devices. Um, and a disruptive technology, I mean, nice examples of that is, um, you know, go, go back 10 years if you wanted to uh, get a taxi home from a restaurant, well, you'd book it with your local taxi company, you'd phone them up. Now, if you live in a big city, you've probably got Uber on your phone um, or um, another ride sharing um, technology, and it's an app. You can book it there and then, you can see how long it's gonna be to arrive, um, and you know what the cost is gonna be up front. Um, and that has hugely disrupted the taxi industry. Um, that's a, it's a, which is a lovely example um, of, a, of, a, of a disruptive technology that has really changed the market. Any type of e-commerce is another one. Amazon is another one. Think about all the things that you used to go to a shop to buy that you now buy from Amazon and have delivered to your house. And this is just another example of how technology um, has really changed the way that people live their lives. And the, the smart speakers and housing and, and your heating controls, great examples of those. Um, this is a phrase that we see repeated in several places around uh, this advanced information, that our product is there to help people to live their lives more easily. Um, this is all about suiting you as an individual customer. Um, and that means that, you know, our product needs to keep up to date with how people are using it. So it's no good just creating the product and then just getting it out there. The software that sits behind it needs to constantly update. It needs to remain compatible with the other devices. This is the smart speaker. Um, that smart speaker needs to remain compatible with the devices that people are, are, are buying and adding into their homes. It's no good it just being compatible with what's available now. It needs to be kind of future proofed. Um, this here, um, big risk for the business. Um, and particularly, as we mentioned earlier, around exports. Um, if you've got a poor internet connection, so we're, we're trying to move into a developing market, our products just don't work. We can only really export um, to, or to developed economies. Not an issue in our home market of Westland, which we're told is a, is a well-developed economy. Now, it does tell us here that we already have 
significant export sales. Um, now, I question that a little bit because when you look in our financials, and we're going to do that on the second, second night, um, there's no segmental information given around our international sales. Um, there's nothing around segmental. So it tells us about our different product lines, you know, what we sell with the smart speaker, what we sell with the heating controls, but it doesn't tell us about anything overseas. So that means if you remember your financial reporting rules, um, it means that our, our export sales can't be more than 10% of our overall sales. Um, because if they were, we would be reporting, we would have to report separately the, 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 our, our sales by, uh, by market that makes up more than 10%. Um, so it must mean that Westland is making up more than 90% of our sales. Um, so their definition of significant is actually, it has to be less than 10%, otherwise we'd be told segmental information. Um, I can see that quite a few people are posting questions and things. Uh, if you're able to wait till the Q&A session at the end, that, that would be helpful. Um, okay, into this uh, major competitors uh, for us in our home market. And this is talking about our, um, our, our brand positioning. Porter's five, sorry, uh, Porter's, um, Porter's generic strategies, the classic business strategy, you know, you're either a cost leader, standard product for a cheap price, or you're a differentiator and you're selling a premium product for a premium price. We are heavily, heavily in the differentiated section here. Um, so we do have competition from, from cost leaders, you know, the Ryanairs, the EasyJets, the Wizz Airs of the marketplace, uh, but we're Emirates. Um, we're providing something better for a higher price. Um, and actually, it, from what we're told in this advanced information, it seems like we're the only people who are doing that. Um, there isn't anyone else at the premium end. Everyone else seems to be cheaper than us in our, in our traditional market. Um, and that must mean, if we think of Porter's Five Forces, it must mean that there are some barriers to entry at the premium end of the market. Just thinking about, so what is stopping other people um, from, um, fr from, from competing with us with a premium um, smart home control system for their heating systems? Um, for me, it's a few things. Um, it's our relationship with the house builders. Um, that they know our product, they trust us, and therefore they want... So for someone new to come in, they'd have to establish that relationship with the house builders, uh, which would cost them money in terms of marketing. Um, it's developing our product. So if someone was going to um, create a product that's going to be as good as ours, they're going to have to invest some money in it. Um, so there's going to be some capital investment needed. So it's, they're going to have to have some money to do this. Um, and it's that I think as well, it's that there are no repeat sales. So this, the, you don't sell again and again to the same customers. Um, once one of these systems goes into a house, it basically stays there. Um, and so if you're someone looking at this from the outside, it doesn't look that lucrative as a marketplace uh, because you're not going to be able to sell and sell again to your customers. Um, every sale you're, you're making is having to be a, a, a new lead that you're generating. OK, so we at the minute have a nice position in our in our home, in our established market. Um, the other thing that's probably um, that, that there's probably at play here is that is this is a mature or perhaps even a declining market. Um, we can see that when you look at the financials, again, we're doing that later in the course, uh, but when you look at the financials, um, our sales for the, vent, the, the heating controls have started to plateau and started to fall. So if we've got falling sales as the market leader, it's an indication that the market itself is either static or even going into decline, which again, makes it less attractive for someone new to come in. Okay. Going on to the next page.
Ah, okay. So a nice bit of F2 stuff here about revenue recognition. It tells us we sell our products through building supply companies who then sell them on. Um, so the stuff we want to be thinking about, about revenue recognition is around the risks and rewards of ownership. Um, we should recognize revenue when the risks and rewards have transferred over to the person who's buying our product. But we don't really know when that is. Are these sold on a kind of sale and return basis? Um, so can the uh, building supply companies, if they don't sell the product onto a, 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 an end, you, uh, the, 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 um, the heating engineer, the plumber or the builder, if they don't sell them on, can they return them back to us? If so, we shouldn't recognize revenue until the product has been sold on to its end user, because effectively we still own it until that point. We've just got an agent that's managing the sale on our behalf. We don't know if they're sold on a sale and return basis or if they're just sold to the building supply company and when they take delivery of them, they ownership transferred at that point and therefore we recognize revenue at that point. So there's a little bit of complexity around that. Um, there could also be differential pricing in place. Um, so we could be given volume discounts, bulk buy discounts. Um, so if one of these heating, uh, the building supply companies purchases over a certain amount of volume from us, it may mean that they access a lower price per unit. Um, and if that's the case, um, then we need, there's a bit of complexity there around what price we recognize revenue at. Um, so our systems are gonna need to be um, robust and sophisticated enough that they can track the price of our product depending on the volume that's being sold. And there's a little bit of a hint on that actually here when it's talking about bulk orders. Um, if people are ordering in bulk, we would expect, wouldn't you? If you were buying in bulk, you expect to pay a lower price. Okay, uh, next paragraph here is around um, who is allowed to install our product. Um, and actually, we don't sell our product directly to the public because we don't want the public to be installing them themselves. We want them to go through a kind of professional route where someone who's trained and qualified um, is installing the product, a qualified heating engineer. Now, you could read that and go, oh, opportunity, opportunity. Um, we could start selling these directly to the public. But thinking about it, even the most enthusiastic DIY person, they probably look at a heating system for their house and think, do you know what, that's complicated and expensive. If I get it wrong, it's gonna be expensive to fix. Even, if, so my dad loves DIY, um, does all sorts of DIY around the house, loves a project. He, he's built a little extension on the back of the house. Any sort of woodwork loves it. But if getting him to do anything to do with the heating, he calls a plumber, he calls a heating engineer because it's complicated stuff that if you get it wrong, it's really expensive to fix afterwards. Um, so you could read this and think there's an opportunity here for them to sell directly to the public, but I wouldn't say that that's a route this business should go down. And I think it's quite unlikely as an exam requirement. Um, quite like this, um, that by um, having pro qualified professionals doing this rather than amateurs who could then come back and sue us. Um, from an E2 perspective, business strategy, we've got less reputational risk from faulty devices. And from an F2 perspective, less likely we're going to have to book provisions um, for the legal costs associated with, with rectifying any damage or if we're sued, let's say. Okay, um, tells us that we market heavily through advertising and trade magazines. Um, and that's linking into our Porter's value chain. Our sales and marketing is directed at the people who are making the buying decision. Um, a nice example of how this market works. It's quite similar to baby food. You know, baby food, the person who's going to be eating it is the baby but the person you're really interested in selling to 
it's the mum or dad who's making the purchasing decision. So the person who's living in the house, well, that's the baby in our market. But the person who's making the buying decision, well, that is the well, building supply company and the house builders. So it's the professionals that we're right, really interested in targeting, which is why we're advertising in places where the professionals are going to see us. And we're not really worried about advertising to the general public because they're not the one who's making the buying decision about our product. OK, well, if you're thinking, oh, we've been going on for a while and I could do with a break, uh, we'll be having a little break at, at about eight o'clock. Um, so break in about five minutes or so, so you can just grab a coffee or, or what have you. OK, smart speakers then. Um, now, I read this and thought, is this realistic? You know, which company goes into making smart speakers? Apple did it because they've got a really well-established brand in all sorts of design and consumer products. And they do loads of things that are really, you know, I, I can accept that Apple will make a great smart speaker because they make great uh, Apple Mac devices. The iPhone's brilliant. I used to love my iPod when I had one. I trust them in this sort of market. Is my heating controller is that company someone that I think is going to be brilliant at making this kind of consumer electronics with a great speaker in it? I don't know. I, I was slightly sceptical of this, but we have to accept it because we're told that this is what's happened in the marketplace. We launched in 2016 and by 2020, we're a big player in this marketplace. So even if I think it seems a little bit far fetched, well, it, we're told fact that, that it has happened in this marketplace so we have launched our smart speaker and i think that this is us we are the amazon echo no we're not we are the google nest that's us um the amazon echo um that's this i don't know how you pronounce that this how, how do you pronounce it up burn yip burn whoop burn whoop burn whatever it is um, I, it's um, it, that that company, I think, is the the Alexa. Um, and look, this simplifying users lives, we're seeing that phrase again. Um, second time it's been mentioned. It's a lovely one to write in your own answer because it's something that the markers are going to be looking for. So I definitely want to be using that in my answer somewhere. Um, and these how does a smart speaker work? Well, you've probably got one at home, haven't you? Um, we've got an Amazon. Well, we bought one Amazon Alexa and we loved it, actually. Um, we bought it not really for its smart capabilities. We bought it because we wanted a decent speaker to go in the kitchen. And the smart bit actually is just a sort of fun bonus for us. Um, so we've got the kind of um, the, the, the bigger one. Um, in the kitchen and then actually so my daughter's got one in her room and we've got one somewhere else in the house as well so we've we've got three of these devices now just reasonably common when someone buys one they perhaps end up buying more than one and, and maybe that um maybe that's the case with you as well um for me the key things with my alexa um are that it understands me so it needs a decent microphone that can back out, that can, can block out background noise. Um, and actually for me, even more important is the quality of the speaker because that's the main thing we use it for. It plays Spotify in the kitchen and, you know, it answers a few, it does time. Something I use is a really simple feature of it. When you're cooking, using it to set a timer, it's much easier than doing anything typing because, you know, you need your hands free when you're cooking. So actually, that's apart from it playing Spotify, that's the thing I use it for most. Um, I'm sure different people have different uses for this, but that that's really, it works really well for me. OK, now um, this bit around quality being critically important, I completely agree with this. Um, They've got to spend enough money on the microphones and the speakers, um, because if those bits don't work very well, the device isn't functional for the user. Um, and in the era of social media, um, if this product doesn't work very well, at the back of this document, we're given loads of kind of Twitter type comments. If it doesn't work very well, people are going to shout about it on social media. 
and it's going to end up with brand damage. So we're going to, we've got to get these things right. Um, and last little bit before we, before we break, um, this bit around artificial intelligence um, is around the product improving. Um, it needs to develop over time. Um, and they can't do that with the hardware. It needs to be in the quality of the software. These devices don't really work with preloaded software. When you, when you make a command to your smart speaker, um, it goes off to the cloud. Um, and their tech, their software that they have hosted elsewhere, that's where it assesses whatever you've asked for and then gives you your response. Um, so that software, it's not like it needs to be updated on every device, but centrally, it needs to be kept sharp. Okay, um, we're going to have break there, um, which is going to take us, we'll just have five minutes or so, um, so that will take us up until... Um, on my what my clock that's uh, 20.07 UK time. Um, so five minutes from now, and we'll resume and work through um, the, 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 the next section of the um, advanced information.
Ivan, hopefully you had time there to just make a quick cup of tea or something to uh, keep you going through this session. It's tough, isn't it? Long day at work and then studying in the evenings. Um, it's one of the things I think that makes getting the SEMA qualification so valuable is you're doing it alongside work. And employers really recognize that, that you're able to kind of balance um, different priorities and work alongside them. So we've got about half an hour or so we're going up to about quarter to nine we'll be working through the next section of the advanced information and then there'll be time at the end uh, for a bit of q a um that q a um I'd, ideally if it's focused on kind of management case study and the type of um and perhaps some of the stuff we've talked about this evening and perhaps uh, technical content, um, more of the kind of admin type questions or a course enrollment. Thomas is uh, are on the um, chat panel. So if you've got those sort of questions, stick them in the chat panel as you've got them, because uh, Tom, Thomas can answer those in the background. And I, I'll deal with kind of more technical or management case study type questions uh, at, at the end. OK, so. Here we are, uh, we're on page six of the advanced information here. And uh, so I'm just gonna move my screen over slightly so that we've, here we go. Um, now, if you've got a smart speaker, and I'm sure lots of you have them, um, talking here about this risk, about it misinterpreting one of your messages. Now, if it's something like the wrong song, um, that it plays on Spotify, it doesn't matter, does it? Um, you know, it plays the wrong song, you ask it to play you again, and it, you know, if it doesn't work a second time, I then go onto my phone and pick the song that I want and link it up to the smart speaker. But I don't feel, I feel a bit annoyed, um, but not, you know, like I want to throw the smart speaker out of the window. Um, so that's annoying. Um, but if you're using it to do something like buy a product, um, then that is a potential, well, that's a huge value destroyer. Um, so if, if you buy the wrong product on it and a, a day later, the, the, something you haven't ordered arrives and you get charged for it, and then you've got to deal with the hassle of returning it, um, that is a disaster, isn't it? Um, that is really value destroying. And it's that whole angle of social media um, that people, when that sort of thing happens, people talk about it um, and word spreads. Um, so because we've got that functionality built into our smart speaker, it has to be amazing. Otherwise, it's a potential value destroyer rather than a value add. Um, okay, this bit about learning users' preferences um, and making our product highly personalized, again, that's a real positive. That's part of our sell. Um, that's part of making users' lives easier, simplifying people's lives. Um, but I completely agree with this here. There's a major risk around data security. Um, and that's kind of twofold. Um, one is around, um, well, we could be held liable, so we could be sued and therefore there could be provisions around it. Um, but the other angle to think about it um, is under GDPR regulation. Um, that it doesn't tell us if GDPR applies in Westland, um, but it's a reasonable assumption that it does. Um, most developed countries have either GDPR or a version of it. Um, and the liabilities under GDPR, we have extensive commitments that we have to stick to in how we store people's data and how we use that data um, and so it's not just that the individual user might sue us um, it's that there's going to be wider implications under GDPR so that's really significant for us so we need to be investing in um, well, the, the, the aim here, the thing here around data storage is around security. Um, so we need to have the latest kind of anti-hacking technology and all that sort of stuff. Um, but we also need to make sure that we're completely compliant. Um, so important around security and compliance um, that we're investing in that. There's not much mention of that anywhere in the case study. Um, but that doesn't mean it won't come up in the exam. 
um, SEMA have a bit of a track record with management case study of giving a tiny hint about something in the in the pre-scene and it becoming a massive part of the exam. Um, so you have to be ready for anything. Um, so certainly reading up on GDPR um, is something that's going to be useful for you for this, this particular case study. Um, this bit here about having multiple smart speakers. Um, and um, well, I say, I've said to you already, we've got three in our house. Um, and um, those can talk to each other, broadcast announcements around the house. Now, to me, that is useless. I don't, you know, that's that's not a function that I particularly make any use of. But my daughter absolutely loves it. Um, so she uses the devices in our house as basically like walkie talkies. Um, and it, she uses them as a toy. And it, that, that's... I don't know, on the one hand, it's kind of going, oh, that's maybe a bit silly. But but actually, that is how people use these sort of things. The more it's kind of gamified and it's interesting and engaging to use, um, you can send each other little messages around the house. That increases your loyalty to the product um, and increases your buy-in. And I completely agree with this point here um, around customer loyalty being important for repeat sales if we were going to buy another smart device well actually we did this we bought one loved it and you don't even consider going and buying a different brand because you want these things to be compatible and so once you've got a foothold in the market actually there's real potential for you to make repeat sales okay um, this interactivity with other smart devices, I have to say, this is something that I don't use my smart speaker for at all. Uh, I find that the type of functionality here is the sort of thing that I use my smartphone for. So I might, you know, I do have various smart devices in the house. So we have got smart heating controls, but I haven't linked it up to my Alexa because I've got a really good app on my phone that's linked to the smart um, heating control. So I use it via my smartphone. So for me, the functionality for the smart speaker to be the, the hub device to operate other devices in the house, I don't use that technology. But I do know plenty of people who have them that use them, particularly around lighting. And actually that's, the, the, um, that's uh, mentioned down here. Um, that if you do have um, smart bulbs and smart um, smart switching in your house, that having your Alexa to be able to turn on your uh, the lights at a certain time or whatever um, is decent functionality. Um, and this is mentioned a couple of times um, in the case. Our potential, or our already our close link up with Dronquo. Um, and Dronquo, uh, they, they produce these smart electrical plugs, which has a really, to me, a really kind of natural fit with our smart heating control. Um, and th this word is a valuable one. Um, it's part of an ecosystem. And you would expect your, um, these products, because they are kind of in the same sphere, your heating controls, your plugs, you would expect them to be completely functional with each other. And so your smart speaker that's from the same company, um, you would expect it to, to link in effectively. And we're told that it does with Dronquo. What we're not told is how well it interacts with other companies and other smart devices. Um, but the fact that our product isn't something that people use in isolation they buy it wanting to use it with other devices in their house um, that means that compatibility um, is a key um, compatibility one of those words i never know how to spell compatibility is a key feature for our product um, and that is around our software um, and so the software that we're using needs to be continuously updated um, so that it remains compatible with everyone else's devices. Now, that's quite annoying because when someone updates their device 
I don't know, the, the tech and the, um, the, the technology, the software that is involved with Jonquo for the plugs or lights in someone's house or their fridge if they're using it for that. If they update their software, then we need to know about it in advance so we can update, update our software so it remains compatible. Um, so it's going to need a close relationship uh, with other providers. What we don't want to happen is Dronquo to update their software and then us find out about it later and then manically have to update our software so it remains compatible. We need to know about it in advance, which means we need a close working relationship with Dronquo and anyone else who has popular devices so that our software can remain compatible. Okay. So I've got a, a kind of balance between the, the screen being zoomed in enough so that you can see, um, but it, it kind of jumping all over the place. So apologies if the screen's moving a little bit. Um, for me, this is the key one. Um, because my smartphone, I'm sure like a, I'm like lots of you, I do everything with my phone. Um, and so my that that that's a critical relationship for me that my smart speaker works seamlessly with my phone. Um, and so when Apple updates its software, or you know whoever else Android or whatever, when that changes, they definitely need to be changing the software on the um, on on the the smart speaker so it remains compatible. Okay, then on to this unpronounceable name. Maybe that's something we can talk about in the uh, in the Q and A bit. If anyone's got any better pronunciations for than me, uh, it burn. Um, these guys had first mover advantage. Um, now, how important is that? Um, well, we've already discussed that once someone buys one brand, they're going to stick with it. Um, but I think what these guys did, a little bit like Amazon, is it burn created the market here. But the kind of person who buys tech when it first comes out, it's the kind of person who at the minute has a robotic vacuum cleaner or a robotic um, grass cutting device. Um, it's fringe at the minute. Not everyone has one. But these kind of techie advanced people who buy a robotic vacuum cleaner, at the minute they're expensive, but the cost is coming down. Um, over time, as it becomes more established, there is space for um, other providers to come in and provide something that's a little bit different. Um, so whilst we don't have first mover advantage, um, I don't think it's that big a deal because the market is expanding. Um, and in the last year, our sales went up by 24.5% um, in 2020. Um, so it shows us that this mark, although we weren't first mover, we don't have first mover advantage. Actually, we are able, we have been very able to take advantage of the growth in the marketplace. So this first mover advantage hasn't been that big a deal because we have established ourselves. And so I'm just moving my notes on. Um, okay. Anything interesting and exciting in here? There's quite a lot of repetition actually in this advanced info. Um, so a lot more stuff in here around data privacy, data security, which we discussed earlier. Um, your smart device knows a lot about you. Um, and if you're doing a little bit of wider industry research, um, if, you, if you do a little bit of internet searching about some of the controversy that, that Amazon have got into where the Alexa records and they store recordings for training purposes, um, sometimes your Alexa goes off when you're not intending it to. Um, and, and there have been some, some quite amusing and if you google this you'll find it some quite amusing examples of where amazon have recorded people doing things that they absolutely would not want amazon to be listening to but because alexa has switched on because i don't know the word alexa has been said at some point during these activities um 
Amazon then have these recordings. And these recordings are human listened to uh, for training purposes to try to improve the quality of their software. Um, so there's some quite fun reading to be had around this if, if, you're, if you're so minded. Anyway, I'm keeping this clean, so I'm not going to give any more details about what these recordings are of, but you can use your imagination. You can probably work it out. OK, um, look at this. Repetition. They love it. That phrase again. These devices help to simplify your lives. Lock it away, use it in your answer, repeat it back. The markers are going to be looking for it. You're going to get credit for using it. So key value is around simplification. And that, to make a tech product simple to use, means that you've got to invest a lot in R&D and testing to make sure it's beautifully functional. Okay. Um, here we've got both a benefit and a risk. Um, so we talk about Dronquo, us having a close relationship with them and that being helpful for our own product, um, that it works seamlessly with Dronquo, great. But there must be a really long list of other organizations that our device needs to be compatible with. Um, so, I mean, again, this is repetition for me. Um, but compatibility is a key feature. Our product needs to be, I told you I couldn't spell compatibility. <laughs> um, our product needs to be compatible with a hugely wide range of different organization software, which is really hard to do. We need to be maintaining close relationships with these other providers to allow us to do this. Uh, this is an interesting angle. Um, should we consider acquiring Dronquo? Um, and I would argue, yes, there's a really natural fit between our, so we're, you're, you're a home builder that is building, you know, so you're buying the uh, printer heating control panel. Well, in a house that's got a smart home control panel for the heating, you'd probably expect it to have these smart plugs as well, wouldn't you? Is that something that could be built into the house? Um, or is it something that is sold afterwards? Uh, it's more of a consumer product and the consumer puts it into their house themselves. They plug them in externally. Or would you expect all of the plugs in the house to be a smart plug? It's a bit of an open question, but you can see a future where all of the plugs in a house are smart devices, um, kind of built in rather than added afterwards. In which case, there's a strong argument that Frinter's well-established brand um, is, is something we could move into, either by acquiring someone like Dronquo or developing the technology ourselves. OK, um, on to how we got into the market. So we're a copycat um, and you could go, well, you know, we're late to the marketplace. We're copying someone else. But, you know, we're Apple. And Apple have done this in loads of different markets. You know, they weren't the first ones to create laptop computers, but the Mac is amazing. They weren't the first smartphones, but the iPhone is the market leader. They weren't the first to make portable music devices, but the iPod absolutely dominated the market. Um, so even though we weren't first to marketplace, because of our keen eye for design and functionality, we've really established ourselves here. Um, Ooh, I'm, I really question this. Um, that these smart devices, it's talking about smart speakers. It's talking about smart speakers being a huge risk to us that people won't need a smart heating control panel because they've got a, a smart speaker. Uh, for me, I... I I don't really see this as a huge risk because doing something as complicated as your as your heating with voice control, I mean, it's just not something that I see as, as, a, as a real, I don't know, an issue. But we're told it's a threat. We're told that they responded to it. Um, and therefore, um, you know, this is a given. It, it has happened. Um, but they did uh, respond in a manner that was logical. And I would say logical because we went for this design led approach. Um, 
this section here where it talks about us buying and reverse engineering where we took apart the product see saw what was good about it and basically copied it um you could look at that this is described as a positive here but always good in management case study to be able to argue both sides something can be both good and bad we did well by taking the market leader and understanding it but there's potential ip infringement here um, we could be sued, um, there could be provisions required. Um, that's our kind of F2 angle here. Um, now that hasn't happened already. So we're kind of, what is it, 2016 we launched. So uh, we're kind of four years down the track. It's unlikely it's gonna happen, but it remains possible. Okay. Um, this is a lovely point here around the the market for our ventilation controllers has matured um actually it started to decline because we've got falling well we had falling sales in 2020 for, for this for this product um now you could argue that that's because the market is mature and declining or the discussion we had earlier that this is a heavily cyclical industry 2020 we're not told to talk about loads about covid and pandemic and lockdown and all that sort of stuff um but there's been huge disruptions to supply chains around uh, construction so although house prices are buoyant at the minute in the uk and in other developed markets um, a lot of housing construction has slowed because they've not been able to get timber and steel and all this sort of stuff. So you could argue the market is mature and declining, or you could say it's wider pastel factors um, that have led to that falling sales. And when we eventually come out the other side of the pandemic, maybe these sales will recover as more house building goes on. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, the same thing again and again it's really important that these products are simple to use um and um we in fact this paragraph has got both of the things i've recommended you say at some point products easy to use and it's good to look at when it looks good and is nice to use when it's a real consumer end product like this it helps to drive sales um we have got i love this actually we have got experience in developing new products and we've done it well we have gone from a standing start in 2016 to developing a significant market share uh, we're the number two player and we'll, we'll talk about some numbers on this in a minute uh, but we're the number two player in um in these smart speakers from a standing start in 2016. Um, now that's great because you can use that if we're going to develop something new like electrical plugs or anything else um, you can say we've got a track record of taking a related product and developing something new with it and doing it successfully um, so that's a really good bit of analysis there um, this slightly surprised me that instead of trying to create new software that's going to work for a smart speaker we took our existing software that was just for a heating controller um, and used that now the reason i'm surprised at that is because our heating controller we needed it to be functional cross-functional with our app on our smartphone that's it that's all we're worried about it being able to do our smart speaker needs to be cross-functional with potentially hundreds and thousands of different devices. It's hard to imagine that the software we wrote 10 years ago for this single use is gonna have that cross-functionality. Um, but we had it already and therefore they decided to use it. Uh, we've already talked about um, capitalizing intangible assets, so capitalizing research and development expenditure. Um, and now where we are capitalizing that and it is software rather than hardware um, this would be an intangible asset and therefore uh, we would have to be recognizing amortization on it and it's going to be a judgment about the useful economic life of the of this software how long is it likely to last 
what period should we be spreading the cost over? That's something I would uh, is something we could be we could be asked to discuss in the exam very easily. Okay, um, now this again surprised me um, because our product was our software wasn't particularly functional for cross integration. Um, you would expect that potentially the first users might have given negative press. But we've managed to grow our sales. Sales grew by 24.5% in 2020 for this product line. Um, so potentially the fact our product wasn't very cross-functional to start off with, I would argue that could lead to us really not establishing ourselves in the marketplace, but we have established ourselves and therefore, um, therefore that you know we can take this as red that actually this didn't turn out to be that big a deal. Um okay, down here we are told that um that um yep burn it burn have a 60% market share by revenue. Um, and you can use that number of 60%, and we're told it burns financials later on, um, and this is something we're going to look at next time, uh, but part of your homework ahead of the next session, um, can you calculate the market share of, um, of printer based on this number? Um, the answer is you can, uh, but it's something that's going to be really useful for you to do to play around with the numbers um, to work out that market share. And we will look at that when we do the financials um, in, in, the, in the later session. Um, this is a good point over here, competition authorities. Um, so they, uh, part of their remit as a competition authority is that you want there to be a healthy dynamic marketplace where one person doesn't dominate it too much. Um, so it's very unlikely that we're going to be looking at a link up with Ipburn um, then buying us, more likely they buy us because they're, they're bigger. Um, but even if that was a consideration in the exam, it's unlikely to be allowed under competition regulations. Okay, here are our three devices that we sell. Um, and part of the analysis um, in the little um, in the in the little costing section um, is around uh, the prices for these products. Um, clearly, the mini is the basic one. Uh, the classic is our kind of mid-range um, and the Frinter Friend, um, that's the, the super duper more expensive one. I really don't understand these. Um, I went and stayed in a hotel um, a few weeks ago. We were lucky enough to be able to get on holiday. It was amazing. We went to Italy. It was warm. Having been locked up for so long, it was just so good to get off an aeroplane and be hit by a wall of heat. Anyway, the hotel that we stayed at had in the room one of these. It was the Google version of, of this smart screen. And... I just don't get it. I don't understand why you, I, I, if you've got a smartphone, your smartphone has an amazing screen and you're used to using it and it's brilliant at doing all the things you need it to. Why do I want to learn how to use another device that probably isn't as good as my smartphone, certainly isn't as personal to me. Um, uh, to me, I don't get why you'd have one of these. If you have got one, I'll, I'll be interested in why you have it. And maybe that's something we can discuss in the Q and A bit. Um, but for me, it's the these two products here that that really fit the bill for a smart speaker. For me, this one I don't really understand it, but they, you know, they they it's part of their product range. Um, they all have the same basic operating capabilities, so they all have the same operate using the same software, have the same cross functionality. But the, um, the the bigger speaker, obviously louder, better sound quality, um, and this thing. If you don't happen to have a smartphone, but you do somehow invest in smart devices for your house, then maybe this thing would be useful for you. Um, okay, and we've talked already about data security being really important for this business. It's just reiterated down here. Um, okay. 
Now we've discussed this uh, revenue recognition point earlier, um, but we do sell the friend in a slightly different way. Um, and we are having to sell it. And I think probably a more interesting angle on this um, is around our marketing. It needs to be direct to consumer. It's not through trade magazines and trying to, you know, this kind of mums and baby food thing that we have uh, with our ventilation controls. Um, this is a consumer product that is bought by the consumer where the consumer is making the decision. And so our advertising, our marketing has to be a bit different for this. Now, you could argue this is something we don't have experience in, but we're growing it massively. And we grew by 24.5% last year. So we must be doing our marketing correctly or appropriately because we're doing well. But it is something we don't have experience in. Um, we do have, going into this bit on operations, um, we have a lovely, big, tangible fixed asset, um, a factory that we can use as security for a, a normal standard bank loan. So collateral for a standard bank loan. But, um, and there is quite a big but with this, um, but we have existing debt. Uh, we've got a loan already um, and potentially that loan secured on the, um, on the um on that property already so are there any loan covenants are there any debt covenants a standard typical debt covenant um restriction that the lender places on you is that if you have already got finance that has been secured on an asset um well they won't let you borrow more money against that same asset because it puts their original loan at risk um so lovely that we have this as security, but because we already have some debt financing, there are potentially restrictions in place that, allow, that might stop us from, from, um, from using it any further. Um, oh. Sorry, just scrolling across so you can see the full screen. Um, I just wanted to just touch on their location here. Um, from an E2 kind of staff management perspective, um, 90 miles um, is kind of close enough to manage. Um, not perhaps day to day, um, so it's close enough to manage centrally. Um, you know, you're not going to be, you don't want to drive 90 miles every day to be overseeing somebody. But if there are issues that are taking place in this kind of second location that we have, um, well, we're close enough to be able to get down there quickly and sort out any problems uh, around staffing. Um, you've always got to think as you're reading the advance info, why are they telling me this? Okay. It tells me there's loads of electronics companies based in this tech city where I now have a hub. And so this is a really likely exam scenario. And in the past in management case study where we've been told something like this, it's ended up being in at least one of the variants of the exam that we are looking at collaborating with another organization. And so that's something you're gonna see in the mock exams to help you to prepare for this um, coming up in the real thing. Really likely that they're gonna link up with somebody in the exam to, to work on something jointly. Okay, so my screen's got a little bit funny here. There we go. Okay, um, hinting again around research and development being a significant expenditure for us. Um, and where we've seen this in the past, where a business has lots of R&D spend, it's something that we're asked to explain and comment on in the exam. So I would expect at least one variant of this paper to be heavily focused on a new project that they're doing and should they be capitalizing the expenditure on it, you'll have to assess the scenario um, and then use your knowledge of the financial reporting rules to explain whether what they're doing is correct or incorrect. Um, okay. 
this we don't have any direct sales channels and um, that seems particularly for the smart speaker i would expect them to be doing that surely we should be having our own operations where we're selling this directly rather than relying on um i don't know amazon or um, pc world or whatever retailers um surely we should have our own ability for you to buy this directly um and it's something that so e-commerce is something that is a very likely um step for this business to be taking you know using something like uh, if you've heard of it um like shopify um for this business to set up its own e-commerce to allow consumers to buy directly from them rather than um rather than via a third party um, that's going to increase our margins because we're not having to give a bit to the retailer, um, but it's going to increase our fixed costs. Running a business. Um, and something that they love you to comment on, it is a really good value added comment, is to say if we are investing in this and bringing this, this cost in house. Uh, by establishing our own e-commerce, e that means we've got more fixed costs for the business, um, which means we've got a higher operational gearing. We've got more costs that we're going to incur whether or not we make sales. Um, and so we have to generate more sales to be able to cover those fixed costs. And our returns become more variable because if our sales fall and our, and our, our profits, uh, if, sorry, if our sales fall, our contribution falls, um, those fixed costs stay the same, and it really impacts our profits. The operational gearing is, and I always advise this with management case study, is something I try to comment on in the exam because it's a lovely bit of kind of value add analysis, talking about their, val their balance of fixed and variable costs. Okay. Um, where are we at for time? Well, I mean, we're perfectly at 8.45 um, and we've just made it through to where the numbers start. Um, so that's gonna be the end of our, um, of our, our pre-scene walkthrough for this evening. Um, and the second session um, is going to focus on the costings and financials of the business. Um, so I hope you found that presentation useful and the analysis useful, and it's given you lots of thoughts about areas that you need to research in more detail. Um, if, this, if this is the end of your journey with Vivo and you're just using the taster session, I hope you've taken some stuff out of this that's going to be useful for the exam, or this has perhaps whetted your appetite. Um, if this one was this good, how good is the rest of the course going to be? Um, so thank you for all of your attention this evening, and um, we're going to spend the rest of tonight on Q&A. Um, so if you've got any questions, um, then please stick them in. So uh, we'll go for, um, well, I've put them in the chat panel or in the q and I've got both open. Um, actually, the Q&A is probably, um, Thomas, I don't know if you all know this, are other students able to see it? Um, as, as, a, as, a, as a question is asked, I'll, I'll read it out anyway. So I've had a question, what's the difference between operational case study and management case study? Okay, I'm going to be honest with you here, and, and Frank, operational case study isn't really a case study. Operational case study is, can you remember the technical stuff from P1 and repeat it back? In, instead of being in short form questions, like in the, the P1 paper, can you describe it? The fact that it's in the context of a case study is almost irrelevant because you just have to know P1, E1 and F1 and repeat it back. That's how you pass operational case studies. Okay, Thomas, so please, uh, um, okay. But management case study, to pass management case study, you have to write your answers in context of the business and the scenario. You have to refer to the pre scene document in your answers. You've got to use facts out of here. If you write a bland answer that is just repeating your F2 knowledge, you won't pass. You have to do it in context of the case. So management case study is the first genuine case study. That is how um, that they are different. Um, Okay, uh, I've had a question about when the second session is. 
it's on um so we've got another session actually tomorrow night which is key issues um and then we've got a further session on wednesday we're going to get to know each other very well which is the second half of the pre-scene um okay but lots of thank you messages thank you for the kind messages um julia's asked about when do the webinars take place yes they are in the evenings um, and everything's recorded um satish thank you for the feedback you're very very welcome um i've been asked about can you buy the mock exams as separate products um my understanding is not but thomas um perhaps you can answer that i, don't, I think it's you buy the package um Ah, okay. Um, I've had a question from Margot, which is um, she's been exempted from all of the OT exams up until now. Um, and it, management case study is the first proper SEMA exam. Um, now, um, that puts you like lucky because you haven't had to do all these difficult technical I mean, P2 particular and F2 actually is a beast. It's a hard exam to pass, right? But you've been exempted those, great. So you haven't had to go through that stress. But the downside is that if you haven't studied those papers recently, that technical content recently, you're gonna have to refresh your knowledge. You need an up-to-date knowledge of financial reporting standards to pass this paper. And you need to know a lot of it. So things like weighted average cost of capital is really technical. Um, and you need to know activity-based costing is something that is almost certainly coming up in this exam. It's a big P2 topic, activity-based costing, activity-based management. You need to know these technical topics. Um, one of the things that's really great about the V for Tuition product is that when you buy the case study, you get access to all of the recordings for these technical underlying papers. So you've got to go back and recap this content. Um, if you are doing that, my advice would be don't do anything on E2 because none of it is examined in detail. It's all just general understanding. Spend your time focusing on P2 and F2. Those are the ones where technical topics come up that if you don't know your stuff, you're in trouble. There's nothing in E2 that you, if you didn't know it, that you'll be stuck on a question in the exam. Uh, you're very welcome, Margo. Um, I've had a question about, are you a gateway student since 2017? How can you brush up on your technical knowledge? Um, so same answer really, focus on P2 and F2, and you've got to go back over your notes. If it's from 2017, they're probably quite out of date. I would advise going back over, like for P2 and F2, you've almost got to study those papers again to know the content well enough. Uh, to be able to pass management case study so if you're not doing it with viva wherever you do it you need access to to content that's going to help you on those underlying papers um connor has asked international sales tricky question should we know the fact that the financial sales should be split up great in 10 percent so connor that's something that's in f2 financial reporting around operational uh, operating segments so yes um, it's something they, they would expect you to um, to just be aware of. But um, yeah, uh, the, actually, the other caveat to that, Connor, is I mean, that's, it's a really useful point to make, um, is that in here, if you look at the financials, uh, which are on page um, on page 14, um, they are extracts from our financial report extracts they're not the full thing so it could be that they've got segmental reporting on international sales but it's really weird if you for you to have an extract that um includes segmental analysis but not of the international bit so yeah i i, I do think it's strange that that's not in there um I've had a question around a lot of this exam revolves around linking the precinct to F2, P2 and E2. Curious to know what's covered in the F2, P2 and E2 sessions next week, what won't be covered, what should we study in our own time? Um, so we're going to take each of, the sub, each of those topic areas and go, right, here's the content of, of, of P2. So activity-based management is something that's in there. And we'll go, right, why is activity-based management going to be particularly important for this case study? Well, Frinta has pretty significant fixed costs activity-based costing activity-based management is around looking at your overheads and sharing them out apportioning them appropriately between your products so you can get to more accurate costings and make better decisions 
And it's going to be particularly important for this business because they've got significant overheads. So it is the, the focus of those sessions next week, or sorry, of, of the F2P2 applied is take the technical content from those papers and go, how's it going to be examined here? Um, Andrew, not so do, you need to know P2 and F2. The question is, I need to know P2, E2, F2. Do I need to know P1, E1, F1? Okay, I've got a mixed answer to this. P1, not so much. Um, the management accounting stuff will tend to be focused on the P2 topics, though there is a bit of overlap between P1 and P2, but focus on P2. With the F pillar, they will ask you about any financial reporting standards. So the stuff that was in F1 that's not in, in F2 does get examined in management case study. So you need to know both F1 and F2. Okay. Um, uh, just seeing if there's any more questions in the Q&A. Uh, no, no. I'm just going to go in the chat panel and see if there's... Um, any more questions in here that Thomas hasn't answered? Um, uh, Janica has asked, do we need to refresh theories in full or just selected topics? Um, now I've got, a, again, a mixed answer to this. This pre-scene document is full of hints and therefore we can kind of go, right, well, these are the important bits out of F1, F2 and P2 that we need to know. So you can be targeted. But there have been several management case study sittings in the past where SEMA throw in a random curveball, something that didn't seem at all relevant based on the preceding information. We're told something new in the exam that makes it completely relevant. For example, it could be a business that has very low overheads, very low fixed costs, all direct variable costs. So analyzing that business, you would go activity-based costing, activity-based management would be a complete waste of time. Um, and then in the exam, they go, during the year, we invested in dirt, 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 that means that we now have massive fixed costs. So can you advise us on activity-based costing and activity-based management, please? Um, and you go, oh, well, everything you told us here, told us not to worry about that. Um, but in the exam, you threw it in. So you've got to be ready for anything. So to be well prepared for this exam, you need to have gone back over E2, P2 and F2 in full. Not so much E2. P2 and F2 and F1 in full. Um, and then focus more attention on the bits that we think are likely to be more relevant. Um, Anastasia has asked, is it useful calculating approximated cash flow for companies in the case study? Um, yes. Absolutely, yes. And the reason I like you to do things like that is the more you play around with the numbers, the better your understanding is of the financials of the business. So you're not going to be asked to construct a cash flow in the exam, but the more analysis you do yourself of these numbers, the better. So yes, worth doing, Anastasia. Great question. Thank you for that. Uh, da, da, da. Does enrolling on the elite course make one a Viva student? Louisa, yeah, I guess it does, yeah. Um, uh, okay, got quite a few, okay. Um, um, Margot has asked, do I think that the cost model will be useful for MCS as it was in E1? Not really, um, Margot. Um, the models, in, in E1 or in the E pillar that are relevant for the case study are Pestel, Porter's Five Forces, um, and uh, Porter's Generic Strategies and Porter's Value Chain, which actually sits in P, P1, P2 as well. Those are the ones that are really relevant. Um, the rest of them are more backgroundy. And if you if you spend time discussing other e, E2 models in the exam, um, you don't tend to get credit for it. So I, I wouldn't be focusing on anything other than Porter's Generic Strategies, Porter's Five Forces, Pestel, um, and uh, Porter's Value Chain. Um, 
Added on, um, I don't know if this is good news or bad news. Um, you've asked, are we going to have various tutors for P2, E2 and F2? Um, and the answer is no. Um, it's going to be me for all of the sessions. Um, so either that's great news because you really like this or that's a bit of a disappointment. Hopefully it's the former. Um, okay, I've got some more admin type questions. Lucia, you enjoyed the OCS course. That's great. Um, and Thomas, you've been busy on the typing. Um, what's the plan tomorrow if we sign up this evening, Connor? Uh, so tomorrow um, is looking at key issues facing the business. Um, so we're going to we're, we're going to be thinking about um, what 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 are the specific what what we try to do so that it's not um, another really long session tonight. Having had a sorry tomorrow night, having had a long session tonight, it's tomorrow night. It's a slightly shorter one, which is looking at key issues facing the business and and looking at where it's going going forward. Before we um, on uh, Wednesday night, we do a, an, another longer session. So we, we've got the second half of going through the pre scene on, on Wednesday. You're very welcome. Okay, I think we've answered all the questions. Um, and I, I have to say, this is about the best timing of any session I've ever run. It's all gone perfectly to time. 8.59, all questions answered. We got to where we needed to in the pre scene. Um, so thank you all for your attention and your questions this evening. Uh, I hope you found this session useful. And I look forward to seeing as many as possible as you on the remainder of the course. Thanks, everybody. Oh, uh, one of the webinars for the elite course, uh, Julie Thomas, are you able to share the timetable? Thank, thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Michelle, you're very welcome. Alima Day, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody. Thanks, Tigger.